This was the Agnostic Agile Meetup event on the 15th of July with Stephen Perry on changing the way we change. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking about adaptive business. And I think adaptive business is really what business agility is, is trying to, to grasp for. And um, I think the Business Agility Institute and, and people like them are, are doing a great job. Um, my experience is coming at it from another end, which is from Lean, Kanban, and Agility, but always as a business level. So this is, this is very much about how businesses see adaptiveness and how um, I, with a number of large organizations, help them become adaptive to their business. So this is the description of what I mean by adaptive business. And, and it's a new form of adaptiveness because all businesses are adaptive by, by nature. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. But for some companies in some industries, the speed and the type of agility and adaptability that they need is, is really off the scale. It's, it's unknown. And this is where this is fitting in. This isn't for everybody, but it is for people that are doing startups or they're um, in, in big companies. But it is a very different approach to the traditional approach. And I hope to bring that out as we go through. So becoming adaptive means changing, uh, uh, literally, the transformation of your business from the old world to the new, going beyond your current state. It means rethinking and reimagining what the organization does and how it works to achieve harmony with, with the market itself and with its aspirations of its people, which is vital to this new type of organization. And what types of new value we are creating for customers, particularly in a business-to-business -business service type arena. Okay, so let's get into this. Um, I'm going to be talking, interleaving this talk with a real case study of a very large organization. Um, you would know this company. Um, this was a division of that organization that was global. And they were in large enterprise software, um, small uh, applications uh, as well. But, but they had to bring um, a very fragmented global operation into a new type of operation. And I'm going to be using that as a case study to contrast the new, what I call sense and adapt approach to change and change dynamics and, and operation to what I call the industrial make and sell, the traditional. So this is um, a typical way that, that, that an organization would, would change in the traditional way. Um, usually the people at the top have a favorite way of designing, building, and operating their organization. It's based on what they know before. And particularly if, if there's a, some senior managers bringing in other managers from his previous employment in to take over, what they will do is they'll try to recreate what they know from before. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, that is because when they look at an organization, they are very complex. It, it's very difficult to understand where the power base is, how things work, and, and to understand what creates the dynamics. So new managers are coming in from outside, usually don't waste time to change in the organization into their own image, into something they understand. So instead of the organization, um, the new people learning how the new organization works before they change it. They actually said, we don't know how this works, so we'll get everybody else to change into something that we understand. And unfortunately, that happens too much. Um, but even if it's people inside and you don't have that happening, we are still recreating the old way of thinking within our change programs. So the Experiments have shown that organizational designs are preconceived and almost hardwired, and they account for about 90% of the world's organizations. Traditionally, we design the organization, as you know, into specialism, and then we give each of those specialist areas some targets and goals related to that specialism, and we hope somehow with a span of control of managers, which we assign quite early into this, managers are assigned 
very early into the process and saying you pull all the things that you need from the existing organization underneath you to carry out that function and each manager does this so it's set up in a silo way initially but they're thinking about how do we harmonize this once we're up and running but of course things happen before that happens so managers are assigned and then they um, evaluate all the staff they know the good guys there's talent and they're doing some horse trading between them saying well i'll have joe if, if you have michael and james and and i'll have muriel and and it's horse trading because it's usually done pretty fast and the staff usually don't have any choice in this the organization's announced and then they're told where they are in the organization except for a few really critical places so you might recognize this or not it'll be interesting in the conversation later then managers go out and try and sell those positions as great opportunities for those staff come and join me i'll see you get this we know the story then there's a kickoff usually after some preparatory stages then what happens after the initial uh, euphoria of moving this things start to happen staff start complaining that they didn't get the positions that they manage as a problem i promised them so there's some disconnect and discontent and then what happens the managers have to create a get well plan because they fail to move all the work within this transition there's what i call orphan work things that have been taken for granted but now are sticking out with no owners and during this phase trying to get managers now who know they're under stress to pick up this other piece that was was not working takes a lot of renegotiating and that might take months in the meantime people are still disconnected so that's that's fairly typical of big change programs and the way they do it and the design and the way they approach it is fairly similar okay so we contrast that with a make and sell uh, a the make and sell to the sense and adapt approach which is we are trying to build an adaptive dynamic we can't change the organization with the same ideas that we had before we have to change that so the sense and adapt organizational change dynamics so this is the process this is a sequence and we can tell from this the sequence is very different and we are building change capability into the organization as they are changing. So we start by understanding the customer's purpose. What are they really, why are they really doing business with you? And you might find out a little bit later for some of you that it's, it's not what you think. And I'll give you some ideas because it's often about giving customers what they need, not what they want. So understanding the customer's purpose of why they're using you, what they're doing with your products and services, and what do they get out of that as a business. So then the staff, having got the customer's purpose, they've also got hold of the business purpose, they've redesigned that, and the employee purpose. We're bringing those three things together. They can use Agile, Lean, Kanban, whatever method that they, they like, it doesn't matter. I prefer thinking about these sorts of methods as a much more focus on its function than the form it takes. So looking at this, the staff that start experimenting with new work designs, new workflows in smaller group within their, cust within their current role, they starting to think about how now we know there's a different purpose what would we need to do to change so this experimentation is going on throughout the business and it's controlled then we need to relentlessly focus on delivering to the customer's purpose the employee's purpose and the business purpose there are three stakeholders and if you miss any one of those or you exploit one of those the whole thing fails staff now test the new team designs around the new flows of work this is not senior management this is mid management and staff whether they're technicians guys who do um, 
databases, it doesn't matter. They're all involved because they're designing the work so that it flows better for them and delivers what the customer wants. And they know more about it than anybody else in the business. So they're testing this through an iterative process. Then the staff design the management structures around the proposed teams that are coming from the people who are going to form those teams. So they are saying, if you want to manage these teams, this is the best structure for the management. And we suggest that becomes the organizational structure. Okay, and it incorporates the horizontal integration as well as the vertical integration on the way that we set up the governance, which I'll come to a bit later. Then there's a migration. There is not a kickoff. We migrate to the future state. And the interesting thing is, they are learning how to do that because once we've migrated to the new state, it's going to be in a constant state of change because there is no end state because the market is already always changing. Customer needs are changing. Therefore, the responsiveness of the business needs to change along with it. So we're getting out of continuous improvement into continuous change. Some problems. When we do this, managers complain they didn't get the jobs their staff promised them. I put that in as an aside because the staff were designing the roles. And in the presentation that I'm showing you from the case study, they did actually design the vice president's jobs. And there are people there working uh, for a vice president, and there are three or four levels below them. OK, there's no get well plan, only incremental change towards the future and repurposing when required. There's not a set purpose because the market is changing. Your clients are changing. The competition is changing. And you're looking for new niches, where to move, where to create differentiation. Because what an adaptive organization is about is beating the pants off the competition. Because when you do that, you create wealth for your customers, the business, and more importantly, for your staff who now have a secure job long term the business gets long term profitability and customers get more than they bargain for in terms of value to differentiate them in the marketplace so we can see just the change approach itself is almost like a case study of how they run the organization day to day except in when i'm looking at a change program that pulls it out completely but in the day to day it's still the same, and this focuses on that. So let's get on to the case study. There are literally four types of business in organization. There are archetypes, and the way to think about this, there are two of them which are this industrial model, and there are two that are highly adaptive. There are others in between, and there are various hybrids. Um, and we can talk about that another time about how to manage that. But let's have a look at the um, industrial work climates. What does it feel like to work here is a work climate? It's the thinking, feelings, and perceptions of how things are done around here, how all these complexities fit in into how it makes me feel. And it makes me feel like I'm in an, in an industrial model or an adaptive model. And this work climate becomes paramount later in this presentation. So let's just look at three of these characteristics. I've chosen three out of a number, um, simply for time. There's the leadership style. OK, here are the different types of leader. We have command and control represented by a bus for mass production. Because it's one size fits all, lots of batch and queue. Everybody is locked down into their particular jobs. Then mass customization is a little bit like mass production, but there are more options. You can have more toppings or customer engagement is a little better. But really, it's just a mass production with more variety. That's mass customization. Then we move into sense and respond. These are where you've got networked people, and I don't mean networked organizations, where people know their network. And then they use networked intelligence to figure out what they're doing. They don't work in their box. They don't think outside the box. They work outside the box. The jobs are designed in a way that they can go anywhere to find whoever it is that is needed to work on that problem. So the network specialism 
is about getting those right people to solve problems at the right level of the organization. Right up to sense and adapt. And sense and adapt, this is where information and knowledge is, is fl flowing like, like fluid through the hierarchy and the end-to-end -end business. It's what I call intelligence fluidity. And this is the top. It just manifests itself because people know what they're doing. There's a common purpose. And they, there's no hierarchy other than there's a line manager. So talking about managers, what is the management focus in this? Well, in the, um, the mass production, management focuses on staff utilization. I need you working as much as you can all the time. And I'll try and make it more efficient. And then you've got a bit more spare time. And then I'll give you more work. So the utilization levels are somewhere in the 90 or even the 100% of your staff. There's no room for improvement in that. It's usually massively overburdened because we are exercising and sweating the staff assets. And that leads to work intensification with a focus of cost reduction. Then we move up to mass customization. It's about cost efficiency. It's about variety. And now we go one step further than um, work intensification. We say, well, what if we bring this silo with this silo and push them together with some of that free space? And we get task intensification alongside work intensification. Where is the room for collaboration in that? All you get, at, get out of that is more and more busy, busy, bang, bang work and being overloaded. Moving into network specialism. Management focus is looking at people who are generating knowledge and capturing it and reusing it. And it's not about cost, it's about effectiveness and then driving the cost down. Whereas the other two were about driving the cost down and then get an effective later, if ever. Right up to the top end, new products, creativity, co-creation of value, and we are deeply in the world of the customer. And we are, if, if we are delivering services to the customer, such as IT infrastructure, we are looking at how that manifests itself in the customer's business to help the customer do whatever it they do in their business. And they are not IT goals. They are business goals, as we will see. Now, what? why do co companies choose one of these? Well, from our research, there's one really big reason, and we can see it on here. It's the competitive basis. What is the competitive basis that we are running our business on? And this seems to have stopped. OK, let me just, uh, there we are. What's the competitive basis? Well, the mass producers work on high volume, low margins, economies of scale. You know that. So what does that do for the way that you design the silos, the performance measures, and all of that? Because the focus and the competitive basis decides how you're going to run the business. Going up to um, customization, low margins, value added choices, low cost. Then we move up into the adaptive. This is where we have more in-depth specialties with these expert networks that are free so that we get this network in fluidity, not, as I say, the networked organization, because that networked organization is not the silver bullet everybody thinks it is. In fact, it can, it can really screw up your business if you don't know what you're doing. Right up to trusted advisor, integration, customer outcomes. Now, your, how you make money in those areas is completely different. What you are converting into value is the intelligence and the ingenuity of staff, whereas the others are looking at just bodies to produce and just produce as much as they can, as cheap as they can in the quickest time, very often leading to cheaper, neater, faster waste. So. I'm rushing through this because I know I'm behind on time. But we go on to this. So I want to talk about the sense and adapt model dynamics. This is really simple as a dynamics because the dynamic works at, at a business level of how it all works together. And you can detect this. And, and humans are really good at perceiving these dynamics. So we're about engaging and deeply understanding 
customers really, really, not at the surface layer. If you're negotiating with a customer, it's about IT or products and services or software. It is not just about does that meet the specification. What we are understanding is what does it do for your business? That, are you trying to increase market share? Okay, then that's what I would test my product and service against. Not what I, not what um, I, the specification does, because anybody can make the specification, but nobody, not everybody, can make the other customers, their customers really differentiate themselves in the business. So we can see this is a new form of deeply understanding. Then learning and sharing. What are we learning about the customer's world and the market? And who is doing that? Well, it is the staff right up to the senior management. They're all doing that. They're bringing what I call customer intelligence in, market intelligence, understanding what the opportunities are for, for this. If we remove this waste, we can now deliver this. And then we start thinking about, well, do we want to do that? This sense and adapt is not, um, uh, is not, command and comply. Sensing and adapting between that is, is, does this make sense for us as a business? And that's why they're leading and choosing. But again, it's lower down in the organization. And then we can either improve or adapt the business. And adaptation is now continuous because something is happening in all of those phases at the same time. So let me just summarize that. Engaging and understanding. We are using methods to deeply engage with our customers to understand and quantify their needs and their customer purpose, why they're in business and what are their business objectives. Because the good sense and adapt business will acquire their business goals. Not did I meet the specification. Learning and sharing. We are collecting information about the market segmentation. How are we delivering? Are we delivering value? Or are we delivering a load of waste along, alongside it? How do we share information between managers, department, and leaders? Do you even get to see the leader half the time? Is, are we getting fit for purpose outcomes against our purpose statement? Then we need to enable mid-managers and staff to make decisions on how to choose which areas to collaborate on across the business. And all to how do we serve the customer better? Not did we meet the internal SLAs because the customer doesn't care about your internal SLAs. Enable mid-management to improve and innovate and change the day-to-day -day work activities to better serve customers. Customers, relentless customer. What we have around that is the way that you work like that creates this work climate. And this becomes important now for the rest of this conversation. I'm going to dive into the presentation of the, an actual case study. And I'm going to show how something like 1,800 people had a big conversation with some people that had been trained to have the conversations about what makes their organization works and what doesn't work. This was the spaghetti monster picture. There was a group of people that said, this is our business, it's global. How do customers engage with us? How many layers are between us and the customer? How do we know? We're just producing this stuff. We're putting things up on the network. We've got uptimes. We've got all of this stuff. We're looking at applications. We're fixing them really well when they go down. We are modifying them when the customer's got problems. But can anybody understand this? And nobody does. Because this is what happens to the silos. The complexity goes into the gaps between the silos. And people don't know what those in those gaps anymore. So. This was a team, it was a worldwide team. They were brought together by this organization and they had a task to do, which was integrate this global operation that had, had separate, global, uh, separate regional managers to create a global business, but to do something very, very different. So this was the team. There's people from Japan, India, um, the USA, Germany, France, 
it's a whole whole bunch of them and we were going through this process as we say so one of the things that we had to do is to search for the common purpose and maybe repurpose because we didn't want to do business as usual done better more efficient what we wanted to do is a very different business that will differentiate us so that would call for a different approach the normal approach to um, purpose is managers will senior managers will go up a mountain they'll spend a couple of days they'll come back down and they'll hold these tablets in their hands um, expecting you to swallow them with the new purpose in them and this is a waterfall purpose and it's usually three purposes we will be number one in our seg segment appreciated by our customers we look after our staff best it's not a purpose it's three pieces cobbled together what this is doing is we're looking for a common purpose we're looking for why employees work here what makes them stay we're looking at the customer purpose not just why they buy their products and services but what our products and services but what do they do with them as i said before we acquire their goals i'll give you an example of that when i was at fujitsu a number of years ago we had a very large airline organization coming in wanting to outsource to us um, all their IT infrastructure because of low-cost airline competition and things like that. And they asked the usual questions, um, what's the cost per fix, you know, it, it, what's the cost per, um, per MIPS, the, the network availability, how we would cost all of that, and what's your first time to fix um, all these technical problems. And I said to the, the guy, I said, look, why are you asking for all of this, like this first-time fix on incidents? You ask for 70%. Why 70%? And the, the team looked at each other and they said, well, we were told by a consultant that that should be best in class. And I said, look, with all these measures that you've just said, they're all about how we work and about you managing our costs. You really shouldn't be interested in that. All right. The price will be the price and it will be cheaper another way. And then I explained. What would happen if you contracted with, with me to get our technical help desks um, to hit a 70% first time fix? What if 60% of those 70% could be removed entirely? Now, the first time fix has gone down to 20%. You would then ask me to pay penalties, yet I've removed 50% of the work. That's not even going down. So your production in your airline is not going down. Your staff are working. Isn't that what you want? What you should be asking for is how can I assure that we keep the aircraft in the air as much as they can by making sure that the crew are scheduled on on time? Because from our analysis, you can't get the crew scheduled because your email servers don't work. The list between your airline and another as part of your alliance, people are missing slots out of Heathrow because you don't have the parts. That's what we want to contract around. And we want a tenure outsource, not by giving the customer what he wanted, but what he needed. And we made a heck of a lot of money, and so did they. So this is where we are looking at purpose very different this is business purpose this is about beating the pants off the competition and Fujitsu to this day since 2004 are still the only ones that can do that so that's an example of customer purpose okay so an employee purpose this was theirs um, to contribute with my skills be fairly rewarded in, rewarded in a secure trusted environment that offers me challenge because he wants to grow that's what techies want to do. That's what most people want to do. But they want to do it in a secure environment. So if they are creating wealth for customers and the business, I want some security out of that. Okay. Is that too much to ask? What's the customer? He's buying these big enterprise systems and he needs them serviced. Why? Because he says, I want you to strengthen my business 
in a way that differentiates me from my competition. Because if, if we do that, we differentiate ourselves as well. And not only does it differentiate them, it provides a return on my investment in, in your software. So it pays for itself. So you tell me how to use this to beat the pants off my competition. And then you develop the software to do just that. Okay, so are we getting a picture? The purpose is somewhere else. And then for the business, we provide expertise services, enabling us to produce and sell software by creating and running effective IT infrastructures and the software. Now, that is three different purposes that we recognize. And really what we ought to be doing is thinking about coming up with a common purpose. You don't need to do that immediately, but the common purpose means that any of those people could look at the common purpose and agree with every syllable. Not we do this for customers, we do this for all the business. No, every syllable of that. Because we're expecting the customer with pride to relentlessly pursue and apply our insight, their insight, and our technologies to create wealth and secure for them and for our customers. For them and us. Okay. So we now understand that. Having gone through a purpose, they've now come up with the elements of a redesign. And it's a prototype based on some principles. So we scoped some pieces of work that we were going to try out. These were components. We knew what we needed to do, but we didn't know whether it worked. So we ran them as experiments while we were doing our day job. So, and these are the managers here talking about, you know, who is going to be taking some of these new jobs that are coming up. So let's just talk about the adaptive business flywheel. Let's come out of that for a second. We'll join it in a moment. What we have is a flywheel, the engaging, sharing, learning, and leading. Just think about that as a wheel. The center is an axle. And what we want as we get more and more knowledge, the speed of change, the speed of learning, the cycle that goes round is really important to the level of adaptability. However, like a wheel, we get a lot of friction around the axle. And that is what I call workplace friction. What is the leadership style? Is that conducive for me giving up my best? Do I get willing contribution or do I keep my head down and hope that people will pass me by? Can I choose the work methods? Who makes the decisions? Well, we know where that comes from. All those are blockages. Why? Because it's designed to prevent some of those. But there's an even bigger break on the outside of this wheel called the organization. Its systems, its process, its governance, and its structures. This creates organizational friction, which ends up as workplace friction. And then we expect the workplace to overcome the organizational friction, because this is a worker's thing. This is why Agile and the methods like it stay at the workplace, because the guys at the top think, Oh, that's a workplace problem. You go and use Agile to clean this up, where more than 70% of the workplace problems are caused by this outer ring. But they don't realize that because they've designed it the way they have, and they think it's just the people better do it better. This gives rise to what I call a work climate. We know what frustration there is in this. We know that we could do things but the decision making it takes too long and they always decide on the bottom line on the cost instead of the benefit and the value. Why? Because you are prevented from making a case of what the value was because you're even disconnected from the customer. And I have one phrase, which is the customer is your shield. If you get data and information about what your business does to your customer, both positive and negative, and then you get the data, your data is the sword. Customer is a shield, your data is a sword. And then you can have the conversation with this out, outer circle. This is the team. This is what they did. The business saw the model that they were creating and said, yes, go and test. Uh, these components, how they worked, and their interoperability. And 18 months later, they had, in fact, 
changed their organization into a different type of organization and and 1800 people were sitting in new jobs not top down okay so let me quickly go through because i'm conscious of the time there are some questions that we ask about the climate because i know it's complicated the thing to think about is we as humans integrate all that complexity into how we feel how we perceive it we know what those barriers are but we can't say exactly where they are and how they're connected but collectively we know we are well aware that what helps us decide whether things are safe or not whether we will give our best ideas or whether we keep our head down all of this is the work climate and we can re-engineer that to tell us what's wrong at the organizational friction level and at the work level and put that through the lens of the purpose so how do we do that well we ask questions and for me this is the money slide and if you're going back to your office your teams take this slide take a screenshot of this okay but engaging and understanding how much freedom do your staff have to go and talk to customers about their world it's sometimes it's just a product management manager single point of failure the more people you have engaging and understanding the customer's world the more insight ingenuity willing contribution you would get instead of a single point of failure so are you gathering intelligence about the customer's business and how does that help you look at other uh, using your products in other areas of that customer's business because you're only looking at delivering to one part of the value chain for them but they are bigger look at how you can use those and then you share this intelligence with the team the team that you're in right learning and sharing you need to have organizational understanding if you're going to have networked working working outside the box you need to know who's doing what where to go and build up those relationships and then we collaborate on the big issues instead of collaborating on the busy busy bang bang stuff that nobody really cares about okay do we then share the intelligence with the rest of our function other parts of the business and do we share it with the top and senior management did you know we found this out there's an opportunity here no because that's usually the marketing department or product development all this information is in your business already but people don't know where to look for it it's as if they're looking for gold they're digging for gold and sweating to dig it out and they're standing on a mountain of diamonds digging for gold because they don't recognize the value that's around them it is crazy Performance management. We saw the four styles of management. Which ones suit you or is, is in your organization? Because whether you're in an industrial model or an adaptive model, you and your staff will answer these questions very differently. You'll either answer them saying, yes, we do that, and point to a mass production way of doing it, or yes, we do that, and we do an adaptive way. It's a completely different thing. Both of them say yes to the same thing. But in practice, they are very different things, which is why we need a diagnostic that takes out the meaning of what do we mean by customer focus. Then improving and adapting. Do you, your staff, have influence on the products and services themselves? Well, if you're producing software, of course you would be. But that's not like that in most organizations. Okay, employee influence on management practice. How do we run our business? Influence on other functions. No, they've got their own goals. You go away. Or you've got shared goals against the purpose. Employee influence on the end-to-end -end purpose because it's only end-to-end -end that really satisfies the customer. That's only, you know, you're only as good as your weakest link. But every single business will be one of those four types and they will genuinely answer thinking they are doing this correctly when in fact there are four completely different ways going from mass production low cost right up to customer engagement real business outcomes beating the pants off the competition by engaging all the wealth knowledge and creativity of your staff 
Just imagine mobilizing that instead of just one or two people at the top of the organization driving that down. So I come back to that case study. This was a climate measure. I'll just explain this really, really briefly. You saw the make and sell, and there are two types. And there's the sense and adapt. And by the way, I'm not saying that make and sell is, is bad. If your business is stable and it's going to be like that for forever, then fine. But if it's changing, as I said before, that is not going to move fast enough. That speed of adaptability is not going to survive for those where the business is changing. And you have to decide you're either going to be disrupted or you're going to disrupt. You've got no choice. But you need to prepare the organization to be able to do that. So each of these has, you know, you could have a good mass production model or a basic, which pretty means that it's not very good, standard excellent, and the same for the others. So we did a measurement of this global application company and IT services company. This was before the transformation. This was a blue ticket company. We've got across in both, in all those dimensions, it's the same at the top, gauging and understanding how well are they doing, which of these do they fit in, learning and sharing information, leading and choosing, improving and adapting. Those are the, that's the flywheel unwrapped. And we are going to see how well we do those things. And does it make a wheel when we pull together? So we did a survey. We spoke to the senior managers on this. And I said, how do you think you've done? And this was a survey about 1,000 people. And they said, well, we are hoping we're in the network specialism because that's, that should be our weak spot. But I have a feeling, there's that word again, I have a feeling we are probably in mass customization or something like that. That feeling tells him something. What his brain wants to be and his feelings tells him more about where it is. So this is what happens. These are the questions about A, B, and C, which are the exact same questions I told you to take a, a photograph of a moment ago. This is how it turned out. This company wasn't even a good mass production company. That would have been something. It was basic. So what is it basic at? The A here, freedom and decision making in the mass production model, very little. Customer facing activity, very little. They don't talk to the customer. All, lots of people backed off. In fact, only special people are talked to the customer. C, customer intelligence gathering. No, we don't do that. The top guys come and tell us that. Well, what were they good at? Well, they were good at sharing intelligence with the team. Great. Excellent at that. But sharing it elsewhere? OK, like um, sharing intelligence across the function F. Yeah, that was good because they're not going outside of their function. With other function, G, no, don't talk to them. Sharing with senior management, don't even see them, okay? Performance management, I, they don't even performance manage a mass production system. So this is not a, a command and control business. This was more like a command and hope, which is a lot of freedom, I guess. Okay, so we can see in the last segment about improving, very little influence on the products and the services and the end-to-end -end business. There was usual specialist teams that did that. So after 18 months, probably 24 months, this is where we got. Okay, so the average performance is there, and we can see that um, the adaptability score was 16 out of 100 because there's – there's some weighted performance in that, and we have the models for doing that. So they said, we want to get up to this transformation objective because this is where our rhetoric to our customers is, but we've designed it as if we were building cars. Now, if you were Toyota, great. All right, I wouldn't be using that way to build Toyota cars, and Toyota doesn't. So the, what was happening with the rhetoric and the performance, there was a gap, a big authenticity gap saying, you are not really good at this. So we moved up to here within 18 to 24 months. And there's a spread because not all of them needed to be exactly like that, but there was a good mix. This is a massive shift. 
what you think it felt like to work in this place compared to that you know just your mind can project into that is mind numbing down there no freedom no learning hired hands reorg after reorg to try and improve it and nothing improves it just gets worse now we are adapting the business every day incrementally and we are having top to bottom and end to end conversations in an approach that i call big picture collaboration which i don't have time to go into here and i'm going to bring this to about a stop now um, because we lost some time earlier on because i would like to get some questions there are some extra slides in here which um, i will say you can get those extra slides if you go on to my website which i'll show you in a minute just download um, adaptive business introduction to adaptive business and i'll make sure you get the slides uh, with that as soon as they're available so if you register with us download that document and i'll give you the link for that in a moment so there's this other thing about the change planner i will give you in that um, download in a couple of days the actual facilitation for this change planner okay and that's very useful basically what it said is this is on the left hand side this is mass production that's how the change was done when actually we needed to be across the other side so i've come to the end of the presentation sorry it was rushed <laughs> um you can download the e there's a couple of ebooks there it's on the front page there's blogs on there uh, go to lloydparry.com there is a page um and uh, resources which you can drop down to the sense and adapt academy or you can use that link and go straight there i have now gone online and created um uh, a youtube channel for adaptive business and cultures as, as supporting the sense and adapt academy what i've done there is put together the last couple of years of a bigger presentation looking at the aspects of this onto that one location so, so that you can go and see it. Um, so I highly recommend that you go in and you subscribe, put some comments on, because I can do new videos to whatever comments you put in on. And I'm now creating a whole new set of videos on these micro topics, and you're gonna see a lot more coming in there.